Good afternoon, Hayden Bible Church. Glad to be with you again today. We're going to be spending a little bit of time in God's Word this uh, this afternoon again, and uh, hope you're enjoying these uh, New Life in Christ lessons or these steps of the of the Christian life. And um, wanted to uh, pray before we get started today. So let's bow our hearts. Father, we're so excited to be able to be together in your word today. Thank you for this lesson. Thank you for the wonderful truths of the kingdom that are, that are ours now, that we've been washed by the blood of Christ. And we are so grateful for the ways that you work in us and, the, and for the uh, journey that you have us on, this journey of faith and of growth and maturity. And Lord, I pray today, especially today, Lord, with this subject of victory, Lord, I pray that you would encourage hearts and and I pray that by your spirit you would edify and build up and um, just help us to have a, a, a true, real, biblical understanding of uh, the victory that we have in Jesus Christ. In his name we pray. Amen. So uh, again, today we're going to be in step three, basic steps of the Christian life. Uh, step three, victorious. And um, so hopefully... You uh, received the email. Uh, we had two attachments in the email this morning. One was uh, an attachment for this session and another one for the session later today at 2 p.m. And uh, this session, um, this is kind of an interesting uh, subject, uh, just I think for, for all of us as Christians. And maybe, um, maybe when you became a Christian, um, your new life in Christ began with joy. And of course, I think that's the way it is with everybody that comes to Jesus and uh, their hearts are brought to life and they have this new existence that they never experienced before. And it's a wonderful experience to come into God's kingdom. And, and along with that experience, though, I know if you're uh, a normal Christian, you're, you all of a sudden were faced with new struggles. Uh, Namely, new struggles with different and varying forms of sin. And so uh, maybe uh, think about today what those struggles are that became new in your face, uh, in your life, that you were beginning to all of a sudden for the first time uh, struggle against when you became a Christian. Because the, the, the fact of the matter is, is that when we became Christians, we had this new life born within us. But then we're still housed in this, this body that uh, is indwelt by sin. And so uh, that's not who we are at our core of our being anymore because all things have become new and we've, we've been born uh, anew into Christ. But we still have this situation where all of a sudden sin became an annoyance in our existence and a, that we struggle against. And so we're going to talk a little bit about that in terms of victory. Uh, you can see the little cartoon guy over on the right. He says, will I ever be free? And he's wrapped up in the chains of sin. And so maybe a couple things for us to, to ask ourselves as we get started, the true-false section, and maybe answer these for yourself. It, the true-false, the first one is if we are tempted, uh, it, is, it is inevitable that we will sin because we're so weak. Is that true or false? We'll, we'll get into that answer here in a little while. If we sin and, if, and confess it to God, he will forgive us. Is that true or false? We have spiritual enemies who tempt us. How about that? Is that true or false? As we get into this, uh, I want to make sure that we all recognize that our Christian walk is a, a growing process, a process a process of sanctification. And so uh, I know personally I, I have spent, uh, in, in the earlier days, certainly of my Christian walk, I spent time looking for that magical spot in Scripture. If I could just find it, and if I could just understand that one specific verse, then all of a sudden the, the struggle would go away, the, and, and I wouldn't have any doubts and I in my... Um, and my sanctification would be complete. And so uh, I just found out that actually that's not, uh, the, the pro there's a process of growing and maturity in God's kingdom. And so you might remember uh, probably the overused uh, analogy of, hey, we're not, building, we're not growing squash in the kingdom of God that takes you know, three or four months to grow in the garden. We're growing 
oak trees. The Lord is growing oak trees here. And so it takes time. And there will be a, a continuing time throughout your life of mature, maturing, uh, which is also a.k.a. sanctification, becoming more and more separated off and, and, and like Christ in, in the way that you live your life. So, uh, so anyway, we're uh, going to start today with this first page uh, along these lines and just acknowledge first off that we are engaged in a battle. And so let's go to James 1.13 uh, as we get started here. James 1.13 says, Let no one say when he is tempted, I am being tempted by God. For God cannot be tempted by evil, and he himself does not tempt anyone. Let no one say when he is tempted. Just first of all, let's just make sure that we understand that temptation will come. And that's a normal part of the Christian experience, that temptation comes. And so the the given in verse 13 in James 1 is that temptation will set itself, it will present, be presented in front of us. And so we want to make sure, first of all, uh, that we understand that it's not God who's tempting us. And so uh, it says, if God isn't the one who tempts us, who then are our spiritual enemies? Who would be trying to get us to trip up and fall flat on our faces in sin? Who would that be? Well, let's go to James 4.4. 4. So just look at our Bibles to, for these kinds of answers. James 4.4 4 says, You adulteresses, do you not know that friendship with the world is hostility toward God? Therefore, whoever wishes to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. And so the world certainly is a source of temptation in, a, in the Christian experience. And so we can come up with a million examples of the world. The world system of of uh, probably the lowest hanging fruit is the media type world, movies and things like that, or music. Uh, th- certainly the world thinking, the, the world system, the, the process of, of, t- of, of promoting darkness, certainly that is a source of temptation for the Christian. Let's go to Galatians 5 and, and look there too, right after 2 Corinthians. Galatians chapter 5. Uh, verse 17, 517, for the flesh sets its desire against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh, for these are in opposition to one another so that you may not do the things that you please. So another source of temptation in the battle that we are engaged in is our own flesh, the flesh, the uh, our, whatever that is that's not redeemed as part of our humanness, fallen humanness, uh, that is indwelt and saturated with sin, uh, that's the part of us that's a temptation even to us. And so uh, we would need to recognize that as a source of temptation, our own flesh. Uh, and then 1 Peter 5.8, let's go back uh, just past James again. 1 Peter 5.8 says, uh, uh, Be of sober spirit, be on the alert. Christians, your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. So that third enemy that uh, we're engaged in a battle with as Christians, as, as the, the saints of God, is the devil. So the world, the flesh, and the devil are sources of temptation in the in the battle that we're engaged in as Christians in our, during our sanctification or our maturing or our growth process. So let's look and see how we should respond to each enemy. So look at number two there. Let's go to, to the wonderful epistle to the Romans, and we'll go to chapter 12. And so what is, what should, how should we respond to the enemy of the world? Uh, looking at... Uh, um, I'm going to read verses 1 and 2 because they're basically the thesis of uh, the, the, the 12 through 16 in Romans. Paul says, Therefore I urge you, brethren, by the mercies of God, to present your body as a living and holy sacrifice, acceptable to God, which is your spiritual service of worship. And then verse 2, uh, thinking about how do we respond to our spiritual enemy in the world or the world system um, it says, do not be conformed to this world. 
but be transformed by the renewing of your mind so that you may prove what the will of God is, that which is good and acceptable and perfect. Do not be conformed. And if somebody, so another word for conformed is to be molded or shaped or, or uh, brought into compliance with or yielded to the world. And when we talk about the world in this sense, we're not talking about like planet Earth or the mountains or, you know, uh, beautiful flowers or anything. We're not talking about that. What we're talking about is the spirit of this age type of world, the, the evil system of uh, darkness that pervades the world. And so Paul is saying, hey, do not allow yourself to passively be molded by the world. There's an action that we need to take here. And so uh, he says, but... Allow yourself to be transformed by the renewing of your mind. And that's exactly what we're doing today is we're calling a spade a spade and we're showing ourselves from what God has revealed in his word what the situation is. And the situation here is is that the world will try to mold you. The world will try to suck you into its its, uh, system of thinking and and it'll try to mold you into what it wants you to be, certainly because the God of this world, as Scripture calls him, the devil, who is your other enemy, wants you to think a certain way and ultimately he wants you dead and in hell. So we want to make sure that we uh, allow our, our minds to be, or allow ourselves to be metamorphosized or transformed by the renewing of our mind as we look at the truth of God's word and we live that truth out by faith, as we'll see today. So Galatians 5.16, let's go back to Galatians. A couple of letters over to the right again. Galatians 5.16, how do we respond to our flesh? Paul says, I say, walk by the Spirit and you will not carry out the desires of the flesh. And so uh, there's this phrase, this Christian idea of walking by the Spirit. And uh, so that's another way that we should respond to the enemy. And by the way, two lessons from now, we're going to spend the whole time talking about uh, being filled with the Spirit, walking by the Spirit, and I know that you'll be encouraged as, as we look at that. And then again, the, the last enemy, that how do we respond to the devil? James 4, 7. Let's go back there again. Um, right after Hebrews... James 4, verse 7, he says, Submit therefore to God. So submit to God. Um, And then it says, Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. So if you submit yourself to God and and submit yourself under his authority and to to, uh, walk in the way that he's called you to walk, uh, and, and do that by the faith that he's given you and by the resources that he's given you to walk in those things, certainly with the Holy Spirit living in you. Uh, uh, at the same time, you're to, by, by doing that, you're resisting the devil, and he, he'll just flee from you, Scripture says. And so it's, it'll be a fruitless attempt for him to trip you up with temptation. So... Um, You note there it says that that there's two steps here. Resisting will not work without submitting to God first. So we want to make sure that our hearts are under the submission and and the authority and the lordship of Jesus Christ because uh, that's the best place to be. Um, It's certainly the place of victory. So so anyway, it it says the next section for uh, for questions three through five is we can be victorious and so victorious and so Who is greater than Satan? Let's go to 1 John and ask God's word that he's provided for us to understand who who is greater than Satan. So 1 John 4, verse 4, um, You are from God, little children, and have overcome them because greater is he who is in you than he who is in the world. And so there is one who is in you, who lives in you now as a temple of the living God. God lives in you, and he is greater than he who is in the world. And so there's a, a, a victorious presence living within you now because you are the temple of God. And so who lives in the believer? Uh, and he's greater than Satan. So who lives in the believer? The second one there. Let's look at 1 Corinthians 6. Go back to 1 Corinthians 6. 
verse 19. Uh, um, Paul says, Or do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God, and that you are not your own? You have a new owner that's taken up residence right inside of you and uh, lives in you, and again, the Holy Spirit who is in you. And, and so the Holy Spirit's present li- presence living in you, this is a spiritual Christianity that we live here. This isn't just some, some system of thinking or some philosophical system that men have invented. This is a real living spiritual existence that we have with the real living spiritual God who's taken up residence in us and who lives in there and in, in, in us. And I don't know that anybody could actually explain uh, the, the physics of all that or anything. I can't, certainly, but uh, God says that he lives in me, and I think that the, the change in my desires and affections and things like that that I have experienced since becoming a believer and the way that the Lord's Word comes to life certainly attest to that, and I hope it does with you as well. So, And then who gives us the victory? Let's go look a couple chapters over, 1 Corinthians 15, uh, 15, 57. Who gives us the victory? Who does this? Is it you pulling yourself up by your bootstraps and just trying as hard as you possibly can? Uh, Let's look and see. It says, uh, thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. So it's actually God's victory that's happening when we are victorious in our Christian walk. And so we want to make sure that we're walking by faith in God um, as opposed to being by or walking under the faith of our of ourselves. So let's look at our next section here on, on this page. God gives us resources to be victorious. What kind of resources have you experienced that are available to you as a Christian? So let's look at Psalm 119. This is kind of a famous verse. Psalm 119, verse 11. It reads, uh, he says, Your word... I have treasured in my heart that I may not sin against you. So certainly, um, the word of God treasured in the heart of a of a person who is one of God's children is one of the is a primary avenue for our victory. So, um, so again, the question there, the the the, the assertion below that is: think about concrete ways. You hide God's word in your heart. Uh, maybe you're meditating on scripture. Maybe you're memorizing a verse. Maybe you're memorizing a passage. Maybe you're just going back and rereading that and just making sure that it's so familiar that the concepts, the, the renewing, you're allowing the renewing of your mind to happen as you meditate and digest and mull over those juicy concepts that uh, the Lord's given us uh, in his word. So first of all, his word is... Is as it's as it's penetrating us to the heart, is uh, is is our avenue to victory, uh, and certainly with the Holy Spirit in there, like we just talked about, the Holy Spirit living in us, that word comes to life, uh, which I think is wonderful. Let's go to Matthew twenty six and understand what um, resources we have to be victorious. Matthew twenty six verse forty one. Twenty six forty one says, "Keep watching and praying that you may not enter into temptation. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak." And so, a spiritual activity for us to avoid falling into sin when faced with temptation. Uh, the spiritual um, equipment that we have for um, fighting this battle and, and achieving this victory, the victory that's God's, is prayer. And so let's make sure that we understand that. We're going to be talking more about prayer uh, in the weeks to come on one of our steps of the Christian life, so stay tuned for that. And then let's go back to another resource, Proverbs chapter 4, right after the Psalms, kind of in the middle of your Bible, Proverbs 4, verses 14 and 15. Do not enter the path of the wicked and do not proceed in the way of evil men. Avoid it. Do not pass by it, turn away from it, and pass on. And so uh, uh, another thing that um, we have to, 
to, uh, as a resource to be victorious is the understanding that we're on a pathway uh, with God and that if we turn off of that pathway and allow ourselves to be taken down some other pathway uh, after maybe our friends or the people that we associate with, uh, uh, not to say that we shouldn't associate with people that are part of the world, but because we uh, we want to love them and, and share the good news with them, but if we allow our hearts to be drawn into the same things that they're drawn into by nature, uh, we can get ourselves into trouble and lose, um, lose we wouldn't lose God's victory, we would be walking in a way to not be walking in victory. So, And then 2 Timothy 2, let's go back up to the epistles. 2 Timothy 2, verse 22, says, uh, To flee from youthful lusts and pursue righteousness, faith, love, and peace with all those who call on the Lord from a pure heart. And so, uh, the note there is, meditate on the things that consistently make you fail. Do you have a strategy to avoid putting yourselves into places of temptation? We must not only flee evil, but we must pursue what is good. Um, we must uh, purposefully walk in newness of life. We must purposefully walk by faith in things and, and be thinking on and chewing on and meditating on good things. Also note that we need to pursue righteousness together with the mutual support of other believers. And like we've talked about here in the past, Pastor Steve has actually shared quite a few, on quite a few occasions the idea of your success as a lone wolf Christian. That's not a uh, lone wolf Christian is an oxymoron almost. You, uh, a Christian is somebody who is by nature in fellowship with other believers. It's a Christian is someone who enjoys the presence and is encouraged by fellowship with other believers. And so we want to make sure that we cling to being in fellowship as well. Oh yeah, I forgot to go down the side. So let's take a look at the right side there on that first page. Um, so an assignment for this week is to make sure between now and the next time we're together to pray for a friend, a coworker, or a classmate or a neighbor who needs to know Jesus Christ and write down a specific name there and make sure that that's your prayer for that person. Just pray every day for them to come to the Lord. And then also affirming the truth. The Christian can conquer temptations. Can you recall a time recently when you were tempted and overcame it with God's help? How did you do that? Well, maybe, maybe write some notes down to yourself about how that happened. And, and make sure that you, you, you understand that it was with God's help. Um, and, and that's going to be um, uh, his help is doing it by faith, so that you're doing it by faith in the strength that he provides. And uh, more, more on that in the future. There are other lessons that will help us with that. So let's turn the page uh, and look at the back side. Um, Item number seven there, under the major heading of God gives us resources to be victorious, it says we are all tempted, but does, this doesn't mean that we have to sin. So let's go to 1 Corinthians 10, um, just for some encouragement along those lines and see what God's word says. 1 Corinthians 10, verse 13, says, uh, No temptation has overtaken you, but such as is common to man. So you don't have some special thing that only happens to you and that's never uh, been a temptation to anyone else. It's, it's just that we, we're fallen humans and so we live in this situation where it's either we're subject to the teaching of the world, we're subject to our own fleshliness, the sinfulness that we have still residing in us, and also, we are under demonic, satanic attack as Christians constantly. So, no temptation has overtaken you specifically, but such as is common to man. And God is faithful. God is faithful. Listen to what he's faithful in. It says, who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able? Hmm. But with the temptation will provide the way of escape also, so that, you will not, so that you will be able to endure it. What a kind God that we have. He, not only he, will he not allow us to be tempted beyond what we are able, but along with the temptation, he's the sovereign God, and so he can, he can 
uh, create any circumstance that he wants to create. And, and so as we're being tempted in these ways by the world and the flesh and the devil, the Lord um, is so faithful, he, he won't allow us to be tempted beyond what we're able. Uh, he, and, and, and also, he, he makes sure that in his sovereignty that he provides a way of escape. And so he'll never make it so that you're trapped and your only choice is to sin. That will never happen. There will always be a way of escape, no matter what. It doesn't matter if you're in a, a, a whole room covered with Doritos and bacon and all the wonderful things, uh, you will not be trapped into having to, to, uh, to uh, binge eat the whole room. It, that, that's not going to be, you won't be trapped like that. So uh, he will be so faithful in providing a way of escape. He's an awesome, wonderful, loving God for us. And uh, so he says, so that you will be able to endure it. And so let's just acknowledge temptations are part of being human, and, and it's possible to overcome them. It is. It is possible to overcome them. Some of us uh, have, at varying various form, or times in our lives, been what we would might refer to as addicted to things. Like some people are addicted to alcohol, or some people are addicted to opioids, or some people are addicted to, to other things. Uh, and so it is possible to overcome those things with the strength that God supplies. There, there is hope here. And so, again, remember, this is a journey. You're in a process of sanctification. Do not lose hope if that's you. When you've kept failing over and over and over in your mind, there is still victory in your future as a believer. And the Lord's bringing you into that, okay? So he, and the other thing to recognize out of that verse is God puts limits on temptations and we can resist them. And so God, he doesn't make it so overwhelming that there's absolutely no choice to, but to sin. He doesn't allow that because he loves you. You're a child in his family. He's not going to allow that. What he is allowing is for you to grow and be able to walk by faith in the things that he said that you can walk by faith in, and so you can resist those things. And then in every temptation, God always, every time, without fail, uh, he always provides a way of escape. It's a, you can bank on it. So just uh, believe that and walk by faith in those truths from 1 Corinthians 10, 13. In fact, you might want to uh, like on mine, I underlined that, and then I starred it, and then I probably should, maybe when I get back to my desk, I'll highlight that too, just to make sure I can see it. Uh, and then, so here's our next section. We can be forgiven. Uh, first of all, let's go, let's go to 1 John, which is going to be kind of a key part of our discussion here. 1 John, uh, it's not the Gospel of John, it's the 1 John that's kind of back in the rear of your Bible, in the, section, in the sections right before um, Revelation. 1 John, can anyone, even Christians, claim to be sinless? Is it, should any of us stand up and say, you know, I stopped sinning when I became a Christian? Well, let's look at the Bible and see if that's true. Uh, John says, in 1 John 1, 8, it says, If we say that we have no sin, we are deceiving ourselves, and the truth is not in us. Well, uh, every one of us is, uh, is subject to and does sin. And so, uh, um, and so the Lord's teaching us to, that over time that, that uh, our tendency in that direction because of, of maturing and learning how to walk in victory, uh, that, will, that we will be further sanctified. And so we will have progress in these areas, but the fact of the matter is, is that we still sin. And so uh, it isn't something that we love, it's something that annoys us and we're frustrated over at some points, but as we look to, to the Lord and to give us victory in the sanctification process, uh, we can still walk forward with joy even in that. Um, uh, by, by sinning, it says the fellowship between God and the believer is broken. And I guess I would, I would like to say that it's not broken in the sense that it's irreparable uh, because Jesus Christ has brought us together uh, with God permanently, and that will never change. But the, the quality of that fellowship, the, the uh, sweetness of our koinonia with God when we're in sin is tainted. It's, it's, it's messed up. And so the, the Lord wants us to get back and repent and come to him in confession, and we'll talk about that in a second, so that that can be restored in its sweetness. 
we will never, as a Christian, lose our salvation, though. So, although he still loves us, he will not answer our requests while we are unwilling to confess our sin. And so, if you are, let's look at, let's just look at that. What Psalm sixty-six, uh, Job Psalm sixty-six. Verse 18, 66, 18. If I regard wickedness in my heart, the Lord will not hear. I think the idea there is, is that if our idol is our idol for sure, and, and, and we've like forgotten about God as Christians, and we're, we're over here, and for a, for a moment, maybe uh, our great big shiny whatever it is, is has become our our functional God for the moment, um, uh, we're going to be in a bad spot with our relationship with the Lord. Again, not broken, but, but also uh, just be aware that uh, just like with any loved one, if with your spouse even, if you uh, have uh, a hobby that's taken all of your time away from your relationship with your spouse, certainly that, you're still married, but certainly that relationship has been tainted, that that uh, your, your closeness with them is certainly messed up for a time as you're over here focused on the wrong thing. So, so he's just saying, um, he's not, you're, you're not going to have this, uh, this, um, this sweet relationship uh, and assurance of, of faith that you'll have uh, if you're over here, would have with him as, as, as opposed to being over here focused on the wrong thing. So he, he says, uh, how can we be forgiven then? And so one, a famous verse in scripture is 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and righteous to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So how can I be forgiven when I sin? I just confess it to the Lord and he'll uh, he's faithful, he's guaranteed. If you bring your sin to him and you confess that you're, you know, that wh- whatever it is that you're in sin, he's faithful. And also, because of the work of Christ on the cross, uh, his redeeming work for each of us, he's just also to forgive us our sins and, and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And I, I'm convinced that that cleansing not only is this cleansing that's... Um, um, a, like a forensic cleansing, a legal type cleansing, but I think it's also that he's faithful and just to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And I think that also in- includes our sanctification process where be- we become more and more like Jesus. Sin starts to just fall off as we walk. So what two things happen when I confess my sin? Uh, he is faithful and just to, uh, he, he, is, he is faithful and righteous to forgive us our sins and also to cleanse us from unrighteousness. Those are the two things that we can see there in that verse. When I acknowledge my sin and repent, God forgives me and sees me as clean, not as a dirty sinner or an enemy or a hopeless failure. He doesn't look at us that way. We're children in his kingdom, accepted in Christ, in the beloved. Uh, We are under grace, and he certainly welcomes us and stays us there. Uh, in fact, let's just uh, remind ourselves of a, of a promise in Romans chapter 5. I know that's not part of your worksheet, so this is extra credit you get just by reading this. It says, uh, therefore, having been justified by faith, you and I as Christians, having that, had, ha- having that happened already when we came to Christ, we have peace with God through Jesus Christ. Peace. Uh, there's no more issue between us. That's peace now. Uh, and it says, through whom also we have uh, access by faith into this grace in which we stand. We have a, a, a warm welcome. We, it, the NASB says we have obtained our introduction. And I think that that access, if you start studying out that word, is actually where he's favorably disposed towards us. He, he welcomes us with open arms. He, that's his heart towards us. It's like a, a sweet relationship with a grandparent who every time you see him, they just, you know, you might remember from your childhood where they would just, 
if you were, obviously, if you were um, a person who had that sweet of a relationship, they were just glad to see you, and they wanted you, and they wanted to hug you and embrace you. That's God's heart towards us in Christ. And so uh, it says that uh, we have, he has a favorably dis, a favorable disposition towards us, and we stand in his grace, and we exult, or we rejoice, or we are so excited with and full of glory as we look forward to the glory of God or in our resurrection and our eternity with him. So, so anyway, we're, he doesn't look at us when we sin as just this dirty, rotten sinner that he's hating and, and, and mad at us and just regrets everything and we're a hopeless failure. He doesn't look at us that way. It says, I, and their point is, I feel unworthy because I am unworthy, but he still forgives me because his son paid for it all on the cross. And so we, we have this wonderful relationship that Jesus bought us and gave us with, the, with God. My, my standing before God doesn't depend on how I feel. It depends on the cross. And that will never change ever. The cross is a finished, completed work based on the grace of Jesus Christ. And we can stand fast in that work. We can be confident that we can come to God now, confessing our sin. He will be faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Uh, it doesn't depend on how I feel. My standing before God doesn't depend on how I feel. If I feel like a big loser, if I failed for the maybe the millionth time in this particular struggle area in my life, if I failed even for the million and a half time, and, I'm, and I get up thinking, you know what, I don't want to fail on this. And I want to, you know, that type of a heart is the heart that God's maturing. And so it doesn't depend on how I feel, though, whether he receives me, but on that cross. And so God declared me righteous because of what Christ did, not the way I feel. Uh, and I don't need to beg for acceptance because God's mercy moves him to be a forgiving God. Certainly the sacrifice of Christ on the cross, his, his only son, uh, is the mercy that he's provided. So how should I confess my sin? Let's look at that little box there. Confession is more than saying, I sinned, like, like uh, maybe a, a, a little, uh, some siblings, a, brother, a couple of brothers or a brother and a sister, little kids, you know, when one of them says, I apologize, uh, that's not what this is. Uh, confession involves more than that. It's, it involves sincerity, like you really don't want to have sinned. You regret that in a godly way. I mean, not in a way that you're going to lay on the couch for the next two weeks or something like that, but you regret it in a sincere way, and you wish that you hadn't, and you ask God for help to overcome that sin. You're sincere, uh, you're, cert- you're certainly repentant, you're truly sorry, and, and you're desiring not to commit that sin again. Y- you want to be specific. It's, it's, it's better to, you know, when we've sinned, and the last thing we want to do is bring it up, but uh, the best thing to do is take that specific sin to the Lord and say, Lord, here's the situation. I acknowledge that this was sin, and I just pray that you would forgive me. I pray that you would cleanse me. Uh, thank you for the love you've given me in Christ. And then um, also be quick to recognize my error. As soon as I realize that I've sinned, I should confess it. Otherwise, I'm in danger of falling into more sin. I mean, if you ignore it and pretend like it never happened, the next thing you know, you're on this pathway of, of going deeper and deeper into that. I know from experience. Be humble. Ask for forgiveness of those people who were affected, or excuse me, ask forgiveness of those people who were affected by my sin. And it might, it might be more than just between you and God. It could be that your sin affected somebody else. Maybe your wife when you blew up at her in sin. Or maybe your, your child who you just, uh, you, you ripped and, and tore apart with your words uh, that um, you sinned against. And so you might have to ask forgiveness to somebody really close to you in addition to that person who lives in you uh, uh, just to make sure that you're asking forgiveness of those who you've affected by your sin. Also, accept forgiveness. I should not continue to beat myself up for sins that I've already confessed. So if you 
sin, you, you, don't, you, you bring it, the, honestly, God says bring your sin to him and he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins. And it's done. You don't have to, to do penance, you don't have to say a whole bunch of rosaries, or you don't have to go and, and, uh, and, 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 and beat yourself up for the next couple of weeks, or avoid church, or not take communion, or anything like that. If you've confessed and, and repented of your sin, you just, by faith, with confidence, walk in newness of life, because he's forgiven you your sin. That's the that's the, how the bondage of sin is broken. Christ has accomplished it for you. You walk in, in newness of life then. It's okay. You, you're, um, there's no beating yourself up for sins that you've already confessed. God has forgiven you, and, and you have to accept his forgiveness for you to live a, a victorious Christian life. Because if you uh, go deep into the pit of despond like Pilgrim's Pro- Progress talks about, uh, you're gonna, it's going to spiral downward even further. Don't do that. Walk by faith. Uh, if a God has forgiven me, I must accept his forgiveness and believing, give him, and give him thanks. I must reject Satan's accusation, accusation that I can't be forgiven. Friends, the, the world, the, the flesh, and the, and the enemy, Satan, they want you, the, all, each of those sources of attack, of temptation, of, of darkness. Each one is designed to convince you that the blood of Christ was not sufficient for you. And so the, 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 the strategy that used by each one is that you can't be, they, they, they drip lies like, you can't be forgiven for that. I mean, I mean, everybody else can, but you specifically, since this is the hundredth time this has happened, uh, you know what, um, you can't be forgiven for something like that, especially now. Those are lies that uh, we need to resist uh, with the truth of God. And so uh, the wonderful truth is that we have received showers of blessing in the kingdom of God as believers, washed by the blood of Christ, as saints separated off from the world and, and put in his kingdom. We have a whole new citizenship now. And it's a citizenship where grace reigns. And so that's one of the reasons why I'm so excited about all the time the, the, the epistle to the Romans is because grace reigns in Romans. And uh, it's the thing that each one of us needs to remember. So let's summarize there at the bottom. Who are our spiritual enemies? The world, the flesh, and the devil. What resources do we have to conquer them? All kinds of them, namely God's word. We have the Holy Spirit in us. We have precious promises. We have God himself at work to make sure that we're not tempted beyond what we are able. And also uh, he gives us truths to, to, over, overwhelm, or to overwhelm those temptations so that we can be victorious. Uh, he gives us power by the powerful working of the Holy Spirit within us with a new nature that he's given us, a nature of um, righteousness at the core of who we are, even yet though we struggle against sin. Um, And then if we sin, what should we do to be forgiven? Certainly when we bring our sin to the Lord, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sin. Um, So we we don't want to, uh, although a true believer will never lose their salvation, we certainly don't want to mar the sweetness of that victorious relationship that we have with with God by harboring our sin and, and being unwilling to bring it to him for whatever reason. Maybe we're ashamed of ourselves. So let's make sure that we remember those things today. Uh, let's look at the sidebar, making things right. The one whom, to whom I should confess my sin is God, Psalm 32, but there are, are cases in which that's not enough. You, you need to go one step further. If it's affected another person, you need to talk to them uh, just to be a faithful Christian, to, to tell them, hey, you know, I've sinned against you, and this is what the sin was. And even if you think it's just a, a trivial thing, I want to confess that to you because I want to have a cleanness in our relationship. You can talk to them like that. That's okay. How can I be right with God who I don't see if I'm not right with my neighbor whom I do see? And so we want to make sure that we're right with each other. And then also, uh, kind of one of the next assignments, remember how we... Memorize the first 10 uh, um, 
books of the New Testament. Here's the next ten. Philippians, Colossians. Remember, 1 and 2 Thessalonians, 1 and 2 Timothy, and Titus are all in alphabetical order. So that'll help you with those. And then uh, Philemon, Hebrews, and James. Uh, That's the next thing for you to memorize this week. And then each day this next week, take a look at, uh, read one chapter per day between John 15, starting there and going through uh, John 21. And then spend some time memorizing 1 John 1, 9. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Uh, use your Bible. I think that's a mixture of multiple translations that I just said. But, but anyway, take a look at uh, that. Memorize that verse. Hide it in your heart so that you can have confidence that when you bring your sin to God, instead of being ran over by sin or by the sin that results from the temptation that you face, instead of being ran over by that, that'll help you remember, if I just bring it to the Lord, uh, he will, he's faithful and righteous to forgive it. And not only that, but he's going to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. We want to make sure that we are convinced and let our mind being, be renewed in that truth every single day. That's a key thing for us to understand as Christians. So, so anyway, I uh, hope that that was an encouragement to you. And look forward to next Monday. I hope you're enjoying this series. I sure am because this is foundational truth that each of us needs to have repenetrate our hearts as we walk this Christian walk. So let's close in prayer. Lord, what a blessing it is to have been faced with these truths uh, of our victory that we have uh, as Christians. Thank you for the victory that you've given us in Jesus Christ, our Savior. And Lord, thank you that we can walk in a victorious way. And we pray that you would help us with that every day, that it would be your strength that we're walking in by faith in the resources that you've provided. And Lord, we pray that it pleases you and blesses your heart as we do that. And we pray that you would help us to be always oriented towards you, Lord, and not be sidetracked off onto to our failures or even to other shiny things of the world, Lord, that take us off track, but to be always oriented towards you, Father. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, guys.